All right, so on to today. Uh, Dave Calkin is a research forester in the Human Dimensions Program at the Rocky Mountain Research Station in Missoula. And Dave is, Dave is the team lead of the Fire Economics Group for the National Fire Decision Support Center, a joint agreement between fire and aviation management and research attended to support fire management decision making through improved science application and delivery. Dave's research incorporates economics with risk and decision sciences to explore ways to evaluate and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of wildfire management programs. Okay, so with that, I will hand it over to Dave. If I can find him on the list, there he is. Yep. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Josh very much for inviting me to present today. Uh, also recognize some of my co-authors, Michael Hand, Hari Katawal, Crystal Stonecipher, Matt Thompson, Tom Holmes, and then a number of other people have really helped out with this. Uh, the topic's large fire suppression effectiveness and resource use, and I'm going to talk about a few different studies and just scratch the surface of this and hopefully give you a flavor for how complex a topic this really is. Uh, as uh, Josh said, I'm part of the uh, National Fire Decision Support Center. This is the graphic that kind of explains all of the things that uh, we do. Uh, primarily, some important things is uh, there are two research components, the fire spread research that Mark Finney is in charge of on the other side of town at the fire lab, and then the fire economics research team. We work really closely with the Wildland Fire Management RDNA out of uh, NIFSI in Boise. And then obviously fire and aviation management is a key partner, not only providing the fundings, but also uh, really critical in helping us understand the applied problems that the field experiences. The human factors and risk management uh, RDNA was also part of this, but they've uh, recently independently chartered and are uh, kind of now a, an independent entity from the uh, decision support center. So I'm going to start out just kind of giving a brief uh, description of why this all matters, the current conditions, and being an economist, obviously cost is a fairly important factor here. This year was the first year that we crossed the 50% mark. The Forest Service's budget, over 50%, I think it was 52% in FY 2013, was associated with wildfire management. And if you look at the trends in wildfire management, particularly suppression, but the entirety of wildfire management, the costs are increasing ever since 2000. There's been substantial increases over time. And given that our budgets are essentially flat once you account for inflation, this has had a, a really significant impact to all other programs within the agency. Interestingly, despite this scale of investment, relatively little is understood about how suppression actions influence wildfire growth and net value change to highly valued resources. As I said, I'm going to try to shed a little bit of light on this, but I think what you'll see is there are more questions than answers coming from this line of research. And uh, going back to the National Fire Decision Support Center, the uh, team I lead, the economics team I lead, really has kind of three primary research focus areas right now. Suppression effecti effectiveness being one of them. The other would be spatial wildfire risk assessment, uh, developing tools and processes to better uh, create planning and mitigation actions to improve fire management outcomes. And then also understanding uh, costs of wildfire suppression and factors that influence these costs. So with suppression effectiveness, I'm going to talk about three different uh, topics here today. First of all, kind of go over uh, some recent studies on the productivity of suppression resources and containing large fires. Talk a little bit about specific resources, large air tankers, one of the uh, most prominent and high visibility resources that we have. What do we know about how they're used and how effective they are in uh, large fire management and initial attack. And then finally, just start to give a little bit of an influence about some human factors and some quantitative research we've done to understand how the specific incident management team influences the amount of resources assigned to an event. Let me see if I can get this out of the way a little bit. No, I guess not. All right. Uh, so looking at large fire suppression modeling, uh, one of the things is we, we have for quite some time really been able to think about um, initial attack modeling. And this is probably best represented by the Fried and Fried model from approximately 20 years ago or so that's still being used. And what we do is we look at an ignition and then grow the fire based on the fuels and weather conditions. 
and look at the rate of spread as a growing ellipse. Um, and then we quantify the number and timing of the resources, the initial attack resources that show up to suppress the fire. Typically starting with the heel of the fire, then going to the flank, and if you have enough resources there in a timely fashion, eventually you're able to take on the head of the fire. And if that occurs within the first burning period, we have a successful initial attack. If, however, the fire is growing at such a rate that uh, the resources can't contain it, then we have an escape fire. And really, we're interested in the escape fires here. All right, what's going on now? There we go. So uh, trying to figure out, are, is the initial attack model actually relevant in a large fire environment? I mean, there's something inherent about these fires that cause them to escape. And so is this a relevant way of thinking about how fires, large fires are contained simply as a production process of the resources that are assigned? Well, Mark Finney and his group uh, published an interesting study in 2009 in Forest Science. And what they did was they were interested in understanding what factors influence when a fire is fully contained. And they used the 209 uh, reporting data. And basically from looking at uh, several hundred fires and trying to understand the patterns of what results in final containment of a fire, they found that quiescence was pretty much the only factor that mattered here. Uh, um, grassland and shrubs acted a little bit differently than timber, but essentially it was the number of non-growing time, pe time periods and the length of those time periods where the fires wasn't growing that really drove full suppression effectiveness. Number of suppression resources and fire size were not significant, kind of surprising there, but this might have been due to the fact that uh, the response to fires were relatively homogenous. The 209 reports are the uh, actively managed fires, wildland fire use aren't in there, so the more uh, resources are typically assigned to the bigger fires and therefore that might have had some influence on it. Uh, Tom Holmes and I uh, did some work following that up and looked at could, uh, whether or not we could model the process using an economic production models. And what we were interested in is what characteristics drove the amount of fire line that held on a specific given day. And the way we defined held fire line is just simply looking at the 209 reports again and estimating the change in fire perimeter and fire containment on a given day. So basically, how much additional fire line was reported by the fire within the 209 report, and then we regressed that upon a number of uh, factors, including the types and quantity of different suppression resources captured from the resource ordering status system, ROS, the fire environment uh, near the fire slope, elevation, topography, fuel type, those kinds of things as well as the weather conditions for that day, the uh, energy release component, wind speed, and other uh, factors. And then what we did is after developing these production models, we compared our modeled results for how much each of these different uh, resource categories were producing relative to some of the published production rates that uh, the San Dimas Tech Development Center has published. And this is the uh, take home from that study. Essentially, we found that for these different four types of resources, we were operating somewhere between 14% and 93% of the production rates that were published in San Dimas. Uh, the lowest being the engines. Uh, dozers had approximately 18% uh, efficiency. Hand crews were operating at about 35%, and helicopters were very close to their productive rates. So essentially what we were showing is that when these resources were assigned, the amount of fire line that was reported on that day was this function of uh, their production rates. So one of the things that we recognized here is, first of all, we didn't know where on the fire these resources were assigned. We just had them lumped up on the entirety of the fire. We didn't know the conditions where the fires were. We had very little information about where on the landscape fire line was being constructed. And there was also a real significant concern about some of the self-reporting that goes on within the 209 report. Specifically, the uh, percent contained is kind of a notorious field that has been used to kind of, uh, it, it's basically, you wouldn't want to report your fire as being overly contained because 
your, your ability to get resources in times of scarcity may be uh, sacrificed. So uh, we wanted to try to understand the spatial environment a little bit better and also try to understand what was going on with the percent contained that was reported within the 209s. So what we did was we looked at approximately uh, 100 fires where we were able to put together spatial fire perimeter growth on a daily basis and understand where the fire perimeter was going and what the amount of line that actually held was. And so this is an example from the Schultz fire in 2010. Essentially what we're doing is we start with the final fire perimeter and then we look at the daily fire perimeter for that day. Any portion of the fire perimeter for a given day that ends up on the final perimeter is basically held fire line in this analysis. And so what you can see on the first day is just a couple of points really where the fire never grew. And then you can see that the fire grows over time. And on day two, the uh, bright green represents all of the places where the fire never moved past that line. And then you can keep moving that through time. Again, uh, less fire line held on this day than the day before. And then the final day, we, held, uh, we get significant containment. Uh, by looking at these data, we can then kind of examine what was the percent contained reported within the 209 relative to uh, when the fire stopped moving. So the day on which the fire perimeter never moved again, what was the reported containment within the 209? And what we can see is there is a widespread in reported containment at the time that the fire stopped moving. And on average, the reported contained containment for the fires that we looked at, and these are 50 fires in this case, uh, the average reported percent contained was only 64%, and the fire never moved. We were also able to examine the amount of resources that were assigned to the event after the fire started to stop moving. And what we found was approximately 30% of all resource assignments occurred after the fire had not stopped moving. What we were also able to do is then look at the, at the landscape and estimate how different features of the landscape influenced the uh, amount of fire line that held on a given day. And this is the marginal effects of a, a range of different factors. What we see is rivers, roads, and previous fires all increased the amount of held fire line on a given day. So it's, it does appear out there that uh, incident teams are using natural features to effectively construct fire line. Also, we see that timber has an influence on the amount of daily fire line constructed. Uh, not really sure why why that variable there and the influence of that, but uh, you know we can think about that a little bit more later. Uh, gust speed and the humidity. Uh, gust speed increases the amount of held fire line. Uh, relative humidity the day before decreases fire line. If the fire was full suppression, then uh, the amount of fire line held increased substantially. And it seems like we're getting better over time. We're increasing the amount of fire line that's being held on a given day as the fire progresses. Well, going to the specific resources, we find some very interesting factors. And these aren't marginal effects. So you can't, it's a 1% increase does not represent a 1%, a uh, beta percent increase in that specific resource. But what we find that's most interesting is that crews have a negative influence on the amount of fire line that's held on a given day. And that's a really significant finding because it's absolutely contrary to what we would think. Engines are probably, are, are evaluated as one of the most, uh, as having the highest influence on the amount of fire line that holds on a given day. Well, I have kind of an explanation on this and I've talked with a number of incident commanders and a few others and it seems to make sense. And essentially what I think this is showing is that the fire actually defines the perimeter and then due to natural, fact, uh, natural factors like change in fuels or change in weather, the fire sits down and then we're able to get control of it in subsequent days. The fact that crews are negatively affected it's basically showing that after significant runs of the fire, additional cru crews are ordered that then have the ability to stop the fire from getting up and moving in subsequent days. Also another, I think, significant influence with these large fires is the burnout operations. The crews will spend many days prepping for burnout operations, but all of the uh, 
accomplishments occur once that fire is uh, ignited and that line holds. The engines being the most significant, I think, has something to do with the fact that engines are some uh, may be highly correlated with a change in fuel. So the more engines you'd see, the more likely it is that the fire is transitioning into a uh, developed area. And typically, once fires make runs into human communities, they have about a one-day run into those communities, and then they're suppressed due to significant effort, as well as that changing fuel environment. Uh, we, we also did some research that kind of shed another piece of light on this, where we had a, uh, a, an analyst associated with the group go and participate on a number of large incidents and try to look at the specific assignments that each for, uh, resource was given and what they were able to accomplish in a given day at the uh, sub-level of the fire, um, at the division level. And this is just for hand crews on these uh, 10 fires that we participated in. And what we found was that for all the hand crews, only 22% of all assignments were associated with direct line building. And the rest, the largest category, indirect, um, holding and mop up, also very significant categories in these assignments. And this kind of, this is some of the maps that uh, we were able to kind of produce and, and think about on these assignments. And this is the Schultz fire. And what it really suggests is to really understand the suppression environment. You really need to kind of look at the incident action plan, understand which division has which resources, what the specific activity uh, the resource was asked to engage in and what the outcomes were. And so this is the Schultz fire, uh, one of the early days on. You see some uh, bulldozer line that is uh, holding on the fire line on the west side, on the east side of the fire line. We see some contingency line, as well as some dozer line that appears to be burned over. And as you uh, progress, you see significant amount of hand line that's held, as well as uh, some additional dozer line. And then when you look at the end of the fire, you also recognize that much of the western flank of this fire was never engaged with, with suppression resources. And so by looking at this, you can really understand where resources were going, what they were doing, whether or not fire line uh, engaged the fire, and if it did engage the fire, was it burned over? And I think this is really the level of detail we need to get at to better understand this problem. So now I'm going to transition a little bit, and I'll come back to the, to some of those issues in a little bit, hopefully. Uh, talk about large air tanker use in uh, U.S. fire management. And this is some work that Crystal Stone Ciphers led up for this group. And so the first question is, where are air tankers used? We got involved in this about four years ago. And the first start is obviously, what do we know and, you know, where can we... How can we characterize use? And what we found out is it's very difficult to characterize the current use. We don't know essentially where air tankers are used and where their drops occur. Drop location data does exist out there, but it's not routinely collected. It's also not easy to tie it to the incident specific event where it was, uh, where it was used. And there is no national scale standardized data set. There's aircraft sensors that log flight parameters, and they do provide retardant delivery points. But matching all this data up is a real, real headache. And uh, it appears to be getting better, but it's still uh, very challenging, and it took a lot of work. And also, there's uh, numerous challenges and errors in the data and things that need to be worked out. This uh, shows kind of the range of uh, different data systems that we had to go through. Crystal Stone Cipher in particular, to really try to associate drops to incidents and the characteristics of those drops. Uh, so I think what you see here is nine different systems that all needed to be integrated spatially to try to understand where drops occurred. And this is kind of how we tried to characterize the uh, use of the drops, basically looking at initial attack or extended attack. And if the fire was an initial attack, did the fire, uh, was the fire contained during the first burning period? And so, again, I won't go through the details of how data flows through the system, but it was a Herculean challenge that Crystal addressed, and I think we've gotten some really interesting information from it. We looked at three years of data, 2010 through 2012, and what you see is uh, drop requests ranging from 2,200 to approximately 3,200. 
270 to 320 uh, different unique incidents with uh, mean drops somewhere around 8 to 10 per incident. So we can then kind of map the uh, characteristics of use across the United States uh, by year and also by the number of different unique drops that each incident got. What you see here is in 2010, a fairly widespread across the western U.S. Lots of uh, use in, in California, particularly uh, low number of drops, but lots of incidents there where we had some bigger fires in the southwest and the Idaho area. Uh, 2011, Texas really lit up as well as the rest of the southwest, and you see a whole lot of use uh, through there. Again, uh, besides that, fairly well spread out, and not all that many drops per incident in 2011. 2012, what we see is significant number of drops per incident spread really pretty broadly across the western U.S. No, no specific region lights up. Well, this uh, then leads us to what are the conditions where drops occurred? Did the drops occur under initial attack or extended attack? And uh, if they occurred during initial attack, did the fire eventually get contained on that day or did it escape and continue to uh, burn on subsequent days? So the uh, we, we look at this as the response by fire, so the number of fires that got responses in these different categories, as well as the total number of drops. And what this shows is that 69% uh, of all the fires that had uh, retardant use, large air tankers assigned to them, were associated with um, initial attack usage, where I can't somehow, somehow reason, but um, even uh, as a percentage of the drops, approximately 50% of all drops were associated with initial attack use. Whereas 45%, uh, you know, 11% uh, of the, well, 28% of the incidents were received drops under extended attack, and 45% of all drops occurred under extended attack. And that allows us to then look at the uh, probability of containment if an air tanker, large air tanker, was assigned to the event in the first day. And what we see here is that it goes from 68%, a high of 29% contained, to a low of 15% contained if a large air tanker showed up on the first burning period of an of a ignition. And that compares the 15% uh, initial attack success compares to the uh, national average of 95 to 98% uh, initial attack success. So I think when we look at this, this kind of raises a number of questions, but I think the primary result here is that what we see is that large air tankers are only assigned to the most challenging events, and in many cases, by the time they get to the event, the fire has already kind of gotten going to a level where it is destined to escape. Well, the next kind of follow-up work we're doing, and, and this uh, th that latest research was recently published in uh, IJWF. This is a paper we've got moving forward now where we try to characterize the conditions that drops occurred under. And we have some understanding of what are the conditions where uh, retardant drops are most effective. And it's influenced by the retardant delivery parameters. Um, basically, do we have a continuous drop pattern? Are there obstacles in the path? Uh, or are there holes in the pattern, retardant delivery pattern that the fire can easily get through? Are the fuels uh, very heavy? And so the canopy becomes impenetrable so that ground fire spread occurs? Or is it light fuels? Uh, also slope. Um, retardant is uh, most effective in relatively flat areas. Also, weather is highly important. High winds dissipate retardant and also have an influence on the fire behavior. And the fire behavior, basically, at the higher uh, flame lengths, retardant's been shown to be less effective. So what we've done here is just, with the data available to us, we try to characterize the drop conditions based on the time of day, the dominant fuel type, and the slope level. And what we see here is that the single largest um, category of drops are associated with late afternoon and very steep slopes in timber. So
So those are all conditions that are associated with very, very challenging environments and conditions where retardant is typically not very effective. Likely high flame lengths, high fuel loading, and very steep. And so this, this gives us some indication that uh, the use of these resources are uh, dominant in the most challenging environments. So is there ways of kind of rethinking this problem possibly? Again, we don't have the details of what's trying to be accomplished and how specifically successful these resources were in getting a targeted outcome. Fortunately, there's been a recent investment uh, by FNAM in the Aerial Firefighting Use and Effectiveness Study. And this is really going to provide some great data, hopefully, over the next several years. And one of the, un one of the keys is recognizing that we need to understand the specific objective of the mission that was asked to be accomplished. Was the intent to build line? Was it to check the fire temporarily, why resources uh, were able to get there, was it to do point protection? All of these things are very valid uses of these resources, but we really don't have any way of capturing it right now. So what we've done, what the uh, Fire and Aviation has done, is develop four teams that are uh, located across the western U.S., and they're tasked with going out to uh, specific events and trying to observe and evaluate all of the uh, aviation drops that they can see, uh, report the characteristics, and make some assessment of the effectiveness of the specific drop in meeting the assigned objective. Also, there will be an aerial IR imaging component to this study, and that will measure the conditions that affect the duration of retardant checking uh, fire spread. And so, you know, with, with these data and these teams out looking at these things, we'll be able to really get a better understanding of how retardant is currently being used, what are the conditions that they're being used under, and how effective are they in meeting the specific mission. One of the uh, real challenges is just because a, a drop may meet the specific objective doesn't mean it's necessarily an effective investment in the broader scale of the uh, large fire management problem, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, but that creates a far more challenging environment. So what we've talked about here is just recognizing uh, the, the complexity of the uh, use of resources and how effective they are. If it was just a technical problem, basically we could look at the primary factors of fire behavior and fuel, uh, firefighting resource effectiveness and availability, uh, the resources threatened, and public and firefighter safety as high values, and then the incident decisions, strategic and tactical objectives, incident complexity, organizational needs, and fire resource deployment would all drive from that. However, in reality, we have a really strong human factor component. Uh, Socio-political influence on fire management is significant. The institutional incentives really drive decisions, and there's uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on there not to mention the psychological factors of the individuals involved in the events and some of the classic decision-making challenges that humans have in uncertain environments. So one of the things we wanted to look at is just could we quantify some of the human factors that influence the amount of resources we see being deployed out on the fires? And so we tried to uh, develop a study that allow us to, to think about what might be driving the amount of resources out there, fire potential and characteristics, socio-political influences and management preferences and risk attitudes. And so for this, we're really just looking at how different are teams that are out there. We're not trying to understand a lot of the different uh, human factors, but just are teams relatively consistent in how they approach fires. So what we did was we de developed a panel data set of incident management teams and resource orders, uh, resource assignments. And so we looked at all of the, the large incident management teams over uh, five years, 2007 through 2011. So type one, type two, wildland fire management, and NEMO teams, a total of 90 different teams. Over five years, we looked at all of the assignments that they had, and then we gathered the resource orders from Ross data for each assigned day, and we had 3,439 assignment days amongst these 90 uh, teams. And to characterize uh, resource use, what we did was we um, 
we, we needed a, a, a simple metric that was kind of unidimensional. And so what we did was we did the cumulative production capacity, the number of chains that all of the assigned resources could produce. So this uh, allows us to kind of simplify some of the models, but it doesn't get at the complexity of do certain teams use aviation and other teams rely heavily on dozers and how do all of those different things affect it. Those are some research questions we have moving forward, but I think um, for this, it allows us to simplify the problem and simplify some of the analyses. So what we said in looking at, what we found looking at the individual fire events is that uh, the self-reported growth potential had a strong influence on the number of resources assigned. Uh, percent contained had uh, an influence. A, uh, it, it started out uh, percent contained actually increases at a decreasing rate and then starts to fall off negatively, not surprisingly. We build up the resources as the fire emerges and then we start getting rid of them as we reach high levels of containment. And also fire size, not surprisingly, influences the amount of resources. So we've taken all those into consideration. Also we looked at uh, how inherited production affects the amount of resources. Basically, the number of resources that a team before you had on the event has a strong influence on how many resources you use. But that kind of effect is reduced over time, not surprisingly, again. Uh, what we see is the, the third team seems to, the second, third, and fourth, and fifth team all seem to be uh, using less resources. The first team has kind of the uh, highest resource use. And the other thing of interest is that the NEMO team seem to be significantly different than other teams in terms of using less resources, typically. This is basically looking at all 90 teams and then kind of identifying the team with the medium, median uh, resource use per daily assignment. And if you look to the left, these teams on the left use significantly less resources than you'd expect. Teams in the right use more resources than you'd expect. And then if it's blue, it's significantly less, statistically significant. Red, statistically higher than the median team. And what you see is uh, you see some uh, blue teams that are uh, higher than some gray teams. And basically, this suggests that they just uh, typically have been on fires that had higher growth potential, higher fire size, and some of the other factors that influence it, but still seem to be different than the median teams. The real take home is that there is a very, very wide spread amongst teams in terms of how many resources they typically bring to an event. One way we can look at this is to kind of track a specific resource, assi specific resources assigned to an event and show how that varies over the life of the event. And this is the Trinity Ridge fire from 2012. And what we did is we just modeled the expected production capacity over time, and that's the blue line. And what you can see is it's really not as sensitive as, in terms of the time of the fire to some of the variables that we'd expect. But we see that the Trinity Ridge fire uh, scaled up considerably higher than fires of similar size and suppression difficulty. And there's obviously uh, significant reasons for it. Trinity Ridge was one of the nation's highest uh, profile fires with a uh, small community at risk. And so this allows you to kind of look at the current capacity of an event relative to what you'd expect and ask the question of does higher than expected use or lower than expected use seem to make sense given the conditions of that event. So in summary for that line of research, research, the IMT assigned to a fire appears to have a significant impact on resources ordered. Timing and order of IMT assignment seems to matter. Uh, additional factors such as resource availability, values threatened, fire location, all of those could improve the model going forward. And we also need to get a better understanding of the expectations of IMTs and their interactions with agency administrators. All of those things kind of drive the resource assignment. But what we're showing is there's significant difference out there that really kind of asks more questions than it answers. I'm going to talk real briefly about some some thoughts I've had recently. This came from some discussions with Van Miller at uh, the conference in Missoula here, the AFE IJ, IJWF conference a couple of months ago, and just thinking about how our decision makers actually engage in the problem. 
And there's kind of two schools of thought that I think are applicable to wildland fire decision making. Uh, Gary Klein's kind of naturalistic decision making, and then Dan Kahneman's kind of heuristics and biases. And you know, basically Klein emphasizes those experts out there and how they're able to manage complex tasks in what seems like very, uh, just have an inherent ability to manage complex tasks and do extremely well without significant models, just inherent knowledge that seems to do very well in certain environments. Dan Kahneman, on the other hand, uh, really focuses on those conditions where uh, decision-making heuristics and biases lead to subpar results. And so, uh, you know, both of these schools are very, very different. They have their own literature and own levels of support, and you can find both of these kind of schools thinking about the fire management problem. You know, uh, Gary Klein, Gray, and Chess Masters are effective decision makers, uh, competent at making decisions, whereas Kahneman, you know, his own personal experience evaluating Israeli ar army officers led him to think that we're really pretty poor decision makers, particularly when uncertainty gets to a certain level. Well, these two guys actually sat down and wrote a paper, and what they, uh, what they came up with was a failure to disagree, condi conditions for intuitive expertise. And they basically came up with two factors that are necessary for effective decision making. One, the cues coming from the situation re that require a decision must be stable, consistent, and capable of, of being consistently interpreted. And two, the decision maker must be competent enough to int interpret the cues correctly, must be experienced enough. My argument is that I think essentially we've come from a situation where the client experts actually could function reasonably well in the past environment to a Kahneman situation where the levels of uncertainty are such that we really don't have the expertise, or nor is the expertise possible to really consistently make good decisions without uh, more thorough understanding of the problems and recognizing some of the heuristics and decision biases we have. So. Uh, like I said, complexity of the current fire management suggests intuitive expertise may not be present. So how do we go from Kahneman's uncertainty and poor decision outcomes to Klein's expert model? Well, I think we need to understand decision making under uncertainty and then facilitate appropriate analyses and decision support. Uh, I don't know if uh, some of you have read the book Nudge where basically we're looking at uh, how do we set up information and tools to lead people towards better outcomes when left to their own devices, and they may choose a subpar outcome. I think also there's a real strong need for improved simulation gaming to increase the experiences, the experience levels of managers and dealing with the uncertainty of the fire environment. So in conclusion, what do we know? Wildfire suppression is the most expensive and dangerous activity in which uh, the agency engages in. Wildfires are heterogeneous events whose management is filled with uncertainty. Uh, quantifying the effectiveness of a strategy requires counterfactual simulation, which is extremely challenging. We don't know what would have happened had somebody chosen a different strategy or gone to a different place. We can't know that because it didn't occur. Also, managers are subject to sociopolitical influences, incentives, and decision biases that ne negatively influence efficient responses. So some research questions. What is management producing on large fires? Are they producing fire line? Are they mopping up? Are they doing point protection? That understanding really requires kind of looking at the specific assignment of each resource and how it fits into the broader perspective, which is extremely challenging. Uh, a really interesting research question is how do conditions differ between held fire line and that fire line that burned over? Uh, are our current mop-up standards excessive? I think what I've heard is that mop-up standards are fairly inflexible. We have a specific standard that we're going to apply in an event, and we go and apply that standard as opposed to thinking about the conditions where mop-up is really necessary versus those conditions where it, it, you know a fire may not likely move even though there may be some uh, hot uh, fuels still proximate to the fire line. How do we identify the necessity for contingency lines? And how do different suppression resources substitute or complement for each other? I think we're starting to answer some of those questions, but there's still a whole lot of work to do. 
Now here's uh, Chip's fire, and I, I hope this doesn't come across as Monday morning quarterbacking, but it, what it does show, I think, is the amount of fire line that can be out there on some of the events. The Chip's was, I think, the most expensive fire of 2011. And what, what we see here is a whole lot of fire line that was out there that ended up being burned over by the event. Well, was that a predictable outcome, or was that simply that some unusual fire occurrence occurred that blew that line out? Would the payoffs, had some of these lines proximate to the ignition actually held, would that payoff have been significant and saved multiple millions of dollars? And was it almost successful, but not quite? Those are the kinds of questions we know. The contingency lines, how necessary were the contingency lines? What was the likelihood that the existing lines didn't hold, and what would the values have been, and the consequences have been, had the contingency lines been engaged? All of these are questions that really need to be better thought out, and I think we need to create better decision processes for, for managers in real time to really evaluate where on the landscape they can be most effective, and what are the conditions where contingency lines are absolutely necessary, where it's worth a shot that's got a low likelihood of succeeding but has a high consequence in terms of values protected, and where those things don't occur and we shouldn't be actively engaging. Those are all very complex questions, and the, the field is left with an incredibly complex decision problem, and the decision support tools need to kind of move towards a, a improved way of uh, understanding how we can help make better decisions. How do we define success? Uh, risk risk trade offs among competing strategies requires consideration of cost, and that's the suppression cost, firefighter risk, and foregone ecological benefits of suppressing a fire versus the benefits, which is the resource damage avoided, and then the probability of strategy succeeding and implications of strategy failed. That last one is the one that really gets complex. The first two aren't easy either, that's for sure. But the understanding probabilities and uncertainties is extremely challenging. And I think right now, not surprisingly, we do a pretty poor job of it. Uh, some of the really fascinating research in behavioral economics is just showing humans' innate inability to deal with uncertainty and uh, the, the typical suboptimal outcomes of risk management decision making. It's not that our people are bad, it's just that people aren't good at it. It is a complex environment, and there's a lot to learn about how we manage this. So I think that's uh, about what I got. I think uh, at this point we can open it up for some questions. Yep. Thanks, Dave. That was uh, that was really interesting. I think you raised some some really provocative questions there, and so that should mean there should be a lot of questions out there. So go ahead and uh, get them in, and we'll we'll start working our way through them. We have a a few that have come in from uh, Paul Dokmachuski. Hopefully I got your name right there, Paul. Um, and he has a couple questions about wildland fire, and he asks about drone use in wildland fire and how those are being used. And maybe you can uh, talk about if you, what you know about how drones were used in this past fire season. I know very, very little about the drone usage. I mean, I think there's there's a key role for uh, improved decision making and uh, improved knowledge, real time knowledge. Uh, those things are all critical, and uh, I think drones have a role there. But I have not had any involvement in drone usage, so I, anything I say would be misinformed at best. Okay. Some some of Paul's questions are more sort of operational questions, so we'll, we'll, I'll try to go through them. And if you can address them, fine. But if not, we'll have to see if we can pass. We can uh, get Paul in touch with someone else. But he asks on on a large wildland fire. What technology is used to actively track firefighters, teams, etc.? Um, he's we're looking for some. He's looking for some data, some GPS technology, maybe that's used to track different resources on a fire. Are you aware? You no, know, I know MT, I'm, I'm aware that MTDC has had a project in the past. Bob Roth would be the contact. I guess I'd start out with. Uh, I have not been involved in in kind of that operational level look at it. So the tech development centers are probably the best places to start, and the name I've come up with is Bob Roth. But Bob might be angry at me for doing that, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's what I got. Okay. And then Paul also wants to know about uh, when doing simulations of wildfires, what is the best model? Is there a standard scenario model to adhere to? So maybe when you were talking about 
some of the gaming of different uh, simulations. Are there some programs out there already in the works or already existing where you could do well, some I mean, of these gaming simulations? Right. There's the standard suite of fire spread modeling. Uh, Behave and Farsight are obviously the, the first that come to mind. Uh, you know, the challenge becomes that Farsight is good for a couple of days out, but the uncertainty kind of compounds itself. If you look at the WUFTIS system, they lean on FS Pro, which is kind of a uh, Monte Carlo uh, compilation of a, a variety of different Farsight runs strung together is probably the easiest way to think about it. But again, what we see is if you don't simulate the next day right and then you simulate based on your simulation, those errors are compounded, which makes it really complex. Not to mention, uh, we don't really have good models that understand where suppression actually uh, goes and the effects that suppression has. So the fact that we're out there doing something changes the outcome, and how do we model that uh, kind of compounds the problem. So there is a, a suite of tools out there that allow us to, to do that. There's some limitations with those tools, but they are kind of the best, best that we have available to date. Okay. Um, Mike Caslin wants to. He's uh, he's wanting to know to confirm that the data, just to confirm, your data of resources or teams only include federal resources. Uh, it's all of the resources that are within the resource ordering and status system. So these are predominantly federal fires, and what we did was uh, so Cal Fire uh, crews would be in there, contract crews are in there. So these are basically all all resources that can be ordered through Ross. Okay. Um, so they do include contract and state resources. Gotcha. Okay. Next question is from Tim Inglesby. Um, hey, Tim. How is effectiveness measured on a fire managed for multiple objectives, i.e. those incidents that might combine some fire line construction for community protection purposes with some fire use that encourages fire spread for ecosystem restoration purposes? Well, again, that's kind of challenging and requires you look at the specific event and almost go down to the division scale. But if you just look at uh, kind of the productive efficiency stuff that we've been doing, those fires that are doing resource use and benefit basically get free accomplishments on flanks of the fire that they don't manage. So uh, I think if you go back to that uh, what was that fire again that I showed? The Schultz fire. What you see, trying to get there, is that a significant portion of this fire line in our analysis here was never engaged. Basically, the fire burned out on the on the ridge tops, and, and folks never went out there. They just uh, observed it. But when we kind of measure the amount of fire line out there, all of that is positively associated to the resources. So it's kind of productive, free production. So kind of a free input from uh, from an economic standpoint. So we would expect that those types of fires should be should have higher productive efficiency rates and and have better outcomes in these types of events, in these types of analyses. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I haven't got any questions coming in now, but just a maybe you know you right there at the end you listed some of the the research questions that you saw that were needed. Are any of those ones that you're actively working on? So what's sort of what's the next step? Well, I think we're starting to really try to look at the uh, implications of um, where on the landscape fires kind of end up. So we can look at, and there has been some good work to date that looks at where fire perimeters end up relative to where they start. How much more prevalent are roads in final fire perimeters than kind of contiguous timber? What are the uh, impacts of historic fires on suppression effectiveness? We've got a few different studies moving forward on that. And then recognizing that the, the fuels treatments, uh, the integration of fuels treatments with suppression really needs to be enhanced. Our fuels program right now uh, I think right now in WUFDIS, they're working at trying to get the spatial facts data linked up so that when we are engaging, uh, when teams are engaged in fire events, they can see where and when uh, recent fuel treatments were done. 
which should hopefully improve the efficiency of where the teams choose to engage the fire. And hopefully, by integrating those things, we can also improve where we put fire lines so that suppression can be more effective. So I think that's, that's a really important question. Uh, and also recognizing that one of the decision biases and one of the incentive challenges we have is we have a very, very short-term view of fire. It is how do we reduce damage this season? And by doing that, we've created the fire paradox. The more we fight fire today, the more we're going to have to fight fire tomorrow. So that temporal component of what's the value of beneficial fire on the landscape is absolutely critical. It adds a level of complexity to the problems, particularly when you're in a spatial environment, but it's absolutely critical in describing the need for more fire on the landscape. Okay. Uh, while, you, while you were answering that question, a couple questions and comments came in. Um, a couple people uh, have commented on the um, issue of mop-up, and uh, Steve Stephen Hubner says, I agree, mop-up standards are not flexible and are usually excessive. As an active type 2 crew boss, I get frustrated when IAP says mop up within 100 feet for days on end with little understanding of fire behavior and the risk of a stump or a hot spot actually escaping. A lot of crew time is spent mopping up heat that it, that has little or no potential for escape, but we are asked to put it out. I'd agree wholeheartedly, and I think that's some of the incentives of we our managers. Uh, one of the biggest uh, kind of negative things that could happen to a manager is if they choose not to engage in high levels of mop-up and something were to get out and cause damage. And so we, we have risk-averse managers who are incentivized to be overly cautious in these environments. And this overly cautious to a bad outcome environment has consequences to firefighter exposure. And I mean, I think that's that's an active area of research that we've engaged in pretty heavily is understanding trade-offs amongst exposure versus outcomes and trade-offs amongst exposure between aviation and ground resources. And it, it really gets to that human factor uh, issue where it, it, it's not surprising at all. All of the influences on decision making are leading towards aggressive suppression and excessive response and you know I think by by looking at the problems in a variety of different ways we can identify those conditions and if we can do a better job of understanding when standards are relevant and important and when and when we really don't need standards we need to look at the situation I think we can we can save some money and improve our safety record. Like I said, when we when we looked at the assignments, approximately 30% of all assignments occurred after a fire had stopped moving. That's a whole lot of money. Right. Okay. Um, next one, a uh, comment from Adam Rogers, and, um, and a question. Great info, good start on getting a handle on understanding where costs, benefits are. One thing I'd like to know is where the temping point is for resources versus benefit. In other words, does at some point the amount of resources actually lower the production and ability to hold a line, et cetera? We haven't seen in these data that there is resources kind of crowding each other out and becoming uh, less efficient the more resources are on it. And, and that's probably because we're looking at the aggregate information. And so when we do have a large number of people out there, they are on the largest events, and some of that gets convoluted. Um, I, I think there is uh, some real challenges. I think one of uh, what this really points to is that large fire suppression is opportunistic. The fire defines itself, defines where it's going to hold, and then it may get up and run again. But when it holds and the weather changes, that's when we're effective. I mean, that's Finney's primary what he primarily showed in that early paper and that's kind of why those crews didn't appear to have a major influence on the daily fire line held the fire is defining our defining itself and then we go and kind of clean it up when it gives us the opportunity so how can we think about being a little more flexible and getting those resources aggressively out there on 
the times and places where they'll be most successful and recognizing that there's times during the event where we're just not going to be successful and we shouldn't be banging our head against the wall. Right. Okay. Um, Rob Walters asked if this presentation will be available out after the webinar and the answer is yes. We're recording it. Um, I'll post it in, it'll be uploaded to the Lessons Learned Center's YouTube channel and you can search for it in there. There'll be a link on the Advances in Fire Practice webpage. Send me an email at joshmcdan at hotmail.com. I'll send you a link and you can pass that on to anyone you think that might be interested. Okay, a couple more questions come in. Um, this one's from Mike Caslin. He says, on your air tanker drop data, was there any fluent influence of gallonage, gallonage, I like that word, gallonage per drop, um, i.e. a seat versus a VLAT, et cetera? Uh, in the drops we were watching, these are just the large air tanker fleets, the uh, P2Vs and the P3s. So, you know, recognizing that uh, the VLATs and the seats, the seat data is pretty hard to come by. The VLAT data should be emerging uh, in the coming, coming years. And I think the AFUE folks are really starting to get a handle on some of this stuff. But the seat data, the seats are all managed by BLM. They have a different tracking system, and so uh, that makes it challenging. But in, in the analysis I, I showed today, those are all just LATs, contract LATs to the Forest Service. So we don't have the MAF data in here as well. Okay. So this is just a portion, obviously, of the retardant delivery that we're demonstrating here. Okay. Uh, next question is from Porfirio Chavaria. And Porfirio asks, uh, what is the overall management goal we are trying to achieve with this research? So what are, what, I think you might have addressed this during the presentation, but what's sort of the, what are you trying to push people towards thinking about? Well, I, essentially, I think we need to uh, do a better job of understanding the risk-risk trade-offs of the decisions we make both uh, during an event and the implications to the future. So if we can become more efficient and effective in putting line basically where it, it's most likely to hold and uh, reducing the amount of effort that goes into the fires, costs and safety will both improve. And so if we understand the conditions where we're likely to be unsuccessful and can avoid those and we can understand when mop-up standards may be excessive and enlighten those under the appropriate conditions. And we can understand where contingency lines may be unnecessary. All of those things will improve our efficiency, improve our safety. But also really understanding the implications and need for fire on the landscape and how that interaction in the future is so critical. I mean, uh, there are a number of events out there where the fire, the only thing that really stopped the fire was the fact that it burned into other large fires that escaped initial attack. And had we been successful in previous efforts, those fires may have been even more damaging than the initial fires. So those kinds of issues are all critical there. And essentially it's how do we do a better job of going to the right places in the landscape for the right reasons in the most safe and effective way. And as I said, you know, as, as, the agency says cost is an outcome of good management. So if we can do good management and improve our management, our costs should come in line. And right now, our costs are uh, very, very problematic to the agency. Okay. Um, next question from Fauzia Massey. And Fauzia asks, can you speak more about intuitive effectiveness and the cues needed to increase success? Not sure if that's your view. If you yeah, to... well, I, I just found that uh, those quotes interesting, and, and I think it's a really interesting uh, area of potential research. I don't know uh, a lot in the background of, of those data, but I think essentially when you look at it, these teams go out for, you know, one to four assignments a year, and they apply the strategies that have worked for them over the past and the way that they've trained is basically just to move up through the existing organization, applying the same things that they learned it when they were, you know, a ground pounder as they move up through the system. And intuitive 
expertise really requires a lot more experience than these people are getting and recognizing that the uncertainty of these problems is hugely complex. So I don't think our, our line officers and our incident managers are well trained in risk sciences. I think that's a place where we've got to start and then I think the opportunity to give extra experience through simulation games and kind of uh, revisiting other events and really asking hard questions about why here versus here, how do we estimate probabilities? I mean, I think that probability is one of the real challenging things because it's a nested thing. You know, the likelihood of a specific line holding is a function of you getting the weather you need, getting all the resources you need, and all of the resources showing up and doing a really good job. Those three things, if, if all of them are high, you still may have a moderate to low probability of success. If one of them's low, you've got a very low probability of success. So I think we need to do a better job of facilitating that intuitive expertise with, with appropriate decision tools as well as kind of simulation gaming to enhance the skill set. Okay. Um, this is a comment, I believe, uh, from Chrisanne Kosel, and, and Chrisanne says, the list included no mop-up on edge of the fire if it gets a natural fuel break, uh, such as water, mop-up distance at the discretion of the divisions, limiting distance to minimize need for snag mitigation while eliminating chance for escape, and cold trail and cold trailing and using IR detectors rather than digging everything up. Yeah, those sound like all great suggestions for ways of uh, improving uh, our, our mop-up approach. You know, I've heard of events with very strict standards that you're going to go 200 feet down in there no matter what, but I think those kinds of standards that uh, were mentioned would be really sensible and, and effective. Okay. Well, we're getting down to the end here, David. I answered a lot of questions here. Um, Tim? Swedberg has a question, and he says, if we fought fire on a one-shift schedule, how would that change the economics? Um, what is, I'm not sure I understand what a one-shift schedule is. Um, so I don't know. Tim, can you type uh, a little more <laughs> description there? Yeah, while, Tim, while Tim's explaining... Um, the next question is from Ryan Becker. He says, Dave, many of these analyses have been based on multiple years of data. How do you account for annual changes in fire severity, policy, direction, resource avail availability as influencing factors? Well, I think those, those kinds of factors uh, affect kind of national level summary statistics. The individual events, um, you can have extreme fire conditions under relatively moderate, moderate fire years in some locations. And they, you know, kind of that map of the large air tanker use that showed how fire seasons change through time. So I think at this level, it, what it requires is understanding the uh, conditions of the specific event that you're looking at. And we, we had ERC, max uh, wind gust, we've, we've looked at a number of different functions and they all uh, weather factors, and they all do seem to have some influence on the effectiveness of suppression. Uh, but when you get at the kind of longer, broader trends, I think it's more relevant to look at the, uh, the, the statistics at higher levels. And I think, you know, when you, when you do look at that, what you see is that costs are rising uh, in some, costs are associated with the severity of the season, but they're also rising irregardless of the severity of the season. And that's that's one of the real challenges we're we're seeing, and you know, there's there's a lot of reasons for that. Okay, so Tim has uh, sent some clarification. He says uh, taking a siesta from noon to six, and more emphasis on night and a full sixteen-hour shift. Well, I think that's that's a very good point. I think what we're seeing is there there are conditions, particularly on these large fires and days where noon to six is a time when it's most dangerous and also uh, largest fire growth. There are probably also days during some of these large events where noon to six can be pretty effective work, uh, work time. So I think you need to be kind of specific based on the forecast for the event. 
Uh, I know night operations brings its own level of concerns. Uh, I have heard and uh, have seen that the 16-hour shift is kind of considered a um, is something that should be looked at and maybe watched a little more closely to make sure that uh, all of the folks associated with the events are working 16-hour days. Because if you look at the statistics uh, from these fires, a large, large percentage of assigned personnel are all working 16-hour days. And is that the reality of it, or is that the way fire management's approaching the problem? Okay. Um, so another question, last question here. We'll wrap it up after this one. And this is from Cheryl Page. And she asks, it seems that tactics applied on wildfires are key, as well as the type and quantity of resources that influence the cost. Is that something else that will be included in future research? Example, box and burn versus direct line construction. You know, I think the, the, the key to, tac to identifying the tactics and where on the landscape we go is that risk-risk trade-off. What's the probability of success of going to one location versus the other? And what are the consequences to highly valued resources, firefighter safety, and cost of choosing one approach to the next versus the next? Again, it's an incredibly complex problem. We haven't given uh, a lot of direction on what those resource values are that we're protecting out there, and how we should compare those to the costs of suppression and the exposure of firefighters. We're kind of left the uh, local decision makers and the incident teams and the agency administrators to come up uh, with those on their own. Uh, but that ability to understand probabilities and understand trade-offs of different strategies is something that I think we can do a better job of training our uh, managers into thinking about the problem better and understanding kind of the human biases that lead to one uh, approach over another approach that might be more efficient. Uh, kind of one of the soapbox I get I get on is that I think that we really under we over plan for almost everything else we do as an agency for the Forest Service. Our NEPA process is so rigorous and demanding, and in fire, given the level of investment, we really don't plan our fire suppression response. We don't invest in planning for our fire suppression response commensurate with the amount of money and the amount of hazard that's out there. And I think that's where we really need to focus our efforts in understanding how we plan for suppression and how we think of when we have an event of these characteristics. Would I go here or would I go here? These are kind of simulation games that we can do in the off season, but it doesn't seem like we have the time because we're chasing something else. And when, if you look at the safety, exposure, and cost of what we're doing in fire suppression, it really suggests that we're under planning in that environment. All right. I think that's a good place to end it off. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. That was a, it was a very provocative presentation, very clearly presented. Um, you're tackling a very complex subject, but a really important one. And I uh, appreciate your time and, and, uh, and I appreciate everyone coming to the webinar and uh, look forward to seeing everybody next time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.